Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. My name's Fiona Lettis and I'm Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research and Innovation here at UEA. And it's my great pleasure to, this evening to introduce Professor Jacqueline Fear siegel to give her inaugural lecture here at UEA tonight. I'll just tell you a little bit about Jacqueline before we start. So Jacqueline read English and American literature as an undergraduate at UEA. After a brief career as a productivity services engineer at British Airways, she won a Kennedy Scholarship to study for an MA in American Civilization at Harvard University before returning to the UK to complete her PhD in history at University College London. Her research and teaching continue to reflect her multidisciplinary training and her most recent interest is in visual studies. She's worked at UEA for most of her career, but spent two years as a visiting professor at the Sorbonne in Paris, a year as a scriptwriter for the BBC World Service, and two years researching and teaching in Carlisle, Pennsylvania at Dickinson College. Carlisle has been both her research base and second home for the past decade. Her research and writing is largely about Indigenous Americans and has won a number of academic accolades and prizes. But her work is outward facing and Jacqueline is keen for it to benefit the Indigenous communities that she researches. She co-founded and is co-director of the Native Studies Research Network UK, which is based here at UEA. After a time at the BBC, Jacqueline continued to enjoy working for the media. She wrote and presented a series of documentaries for Channel 4 and regularly contributes to local radio as well as BBC Radio 4's In Our Time and Great Lives. In Norwich, she's a governor of the Second Air Division Memorial Trust and was a board member of the Heritage Lottery funded 8th in the East project, which collected and recorded the social history of the 8th United States Army Air Forces in wartime East Anglia. Jacqueline's current research is a three-year AHRC funded project shared with her colleague, Professor David Stirrup at the University of Kent. Beyond the spectacle, native North American presence in Britain will explore native North American travelers to the UK to uncover previously unknown visits and encounters and their legacies in both Britain and America. In the lecture this evening, Jacqueline will place contemporary native nations in historical context and show how an awareness of their presence is vital for a proper understanding of the USA in our contemporary world. Please join me now in welcoming Jacqueline to give her inaugural lecture. Thank you, Fiona. That was sort of amazing to hear my life like that. And um, thank you to everybody for coming to my lecture. It feels a little bit like this is your life for me, because there are some people here I haven't seen for absolutely ages. And I want to make, start with an especially heartfelt thank you to the Native people who have given me permission to include their stories in this presentation. So my talk tonight is going to be about the Indigenous peoples of the USA. And they are, there are some very painful stories here. But the main theme, and there are a lot more stories, of courage and hope and what is called within Native communities survivance. So I want to start, you can see a little a bit of him here, but I want to start by looking at the performative work of an artist called Greg Deal, who's from the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. This is Greg on a cold December Saturday outside the Denver Art Museum in Colorado, where he was a resident artist in 2015-16. As you can see, attached to the corners of this enclosure that he's created for himself, it's called Ethnographic Zoo. So it's obviously a play on being a creature in a zoo. And Sorry, I'm losing my papers here. On these signs, it says, do not feed the stereotype. And I've appropriated this instruction for my lecture title with Greg's permission. Greg is wearing a Plains Indian headdress and a ribbon shirt, and the traditional hair pipe breastplate and necklaces, and of course his face, as you can see, is painted. So he's made himself to look like the stereotypical Indian who can be recognized around the world, and probably some of us in this room have dressed up as something not dissimilar to that. So he spent the day moving around his enclosure, doing everyday things. He watched films on his computer, he drank coffee, and he would occasionally stand up and look noble, but he refused to talk, even to anybody that came to try and engage him. He is 
playing Indian, and he's playing with stereotypes, and he's also playing a joke on his viewers and on us, because it turns out that all these items that Greg is wearing, he bought off the internet, and they're all made in China. <laughs> and anybody can buy them and dress like that. So he's not actually a Plains, from a Plains tribe at all. Here he is, looking like a real dude. Is, he comes from Pyramid Lake Reservation, which is up in the, in, close to Reno in Nevada. Put him back in costume. So here he's commenting on his performance. Our Indianness, he says, is based on the American anachronism of what we should be, not what we are. It's about feathers, buckskin, long hair, and red tinted brown skin, not our favorite movies, music, or food. Within this narrative, we live in teepees, not houses in the suburbs. As a result, we are still fetishized, exoticized, studied, and gawked at. Dean's piece is obviously executed very playfully, but the message that he wants to put across is deadly serious. And what he's doing is protesting about popular narratives and image of Indians that reduce them to a single entity, rather than, which is always the Plains Indian with the headdress, of course, rather than the hundreds of different nations that they in fact are. He wants to, to challenge the entrenched romantic cultural stereotypes which disallow the policies of violence, conquest, dispossession, and elimination to which all indigenous peoples in America have been subjected. And speaking of Native Americans today, Deal insists, our very existence is a protest to the policies they have tried to shape us and eliminate us. We are still here, you still walk on Indian land, and we are not your Indian. Strong words. The policies and practices of elimination to which Greg Deal refers are built into America's national narrative. And we can find them very simply laid out in a 19th century painting by John Gass, which is entitled American Progress. John Gass has painted a very optimistic allegorical rendering of the glories of American westward expansion. And there's, there's lots to talk about here. But for the purposes of this lecture, there's some very specific details to which I want to draw your attention. Firstly, the indigenous people. Here you can see a little group dancing uh, some kind of wild savage dance in the distance. And then a smaller group here who, as you can see, are befeathered, half naked, and are moving with the animals, the buffalo, the deer, and the bear, they are essentially moving off the scene because of the presence of this diaphanous, powerful woman who is wearing the star of empire on her forehead. So we are seeing the vanishing Indian. This is a version of the vanishing Indian. So without violence, without resistance, he is, or they are, quite naturally being displaced by the superior society and people that are going to take their place. And that's the second thing I want to flag up, and that is land. What we can see going on here is we've got the pioneers who are setting out going further west, but we've got the settlers. They're already farming. They're already plowing the soil, and they set up the delineators or the markers of civilization. We've got the log cabin, and then we've got the boundary with the picket fence. So these are farmers. These are what Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, they're his heroic yeoman figures and what he called the chosen people of God. And they were, of course, the mainstay of the American Republic. And what we should note, too, is the giant woman. She's quite weird, but she's very white with this diaphanous flowing robe. What she's carrying in her left hand, she's trailing the telegraph wire, which, is, of course, is going to unite the whole nation. It had brought, been put across the, the, uh, America in 1861, but now it's going to be drawing all the different communities together. And in her right hand, I'm not sure if you can read it, but in her right hand, she has, and it's very pertinent to this lecture, she's carrying the school book. So broadly speaking, what we see here are naked and feathered indigenous people conveniently fleeing to make way for American progress or 
the manifest destiny of the American people to occupy and possess this entire continent. In the 21st century, we might more readily understand this 19th century American progress as settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is a fairly recent concept and it's still being rarefied and developed by scholars, but it's invaluable to enable us to see through America's powerful and beguiling national narrative that's up in front of you on the screen and look behind to see the darker side that governs American-Indian relations. We've already identified the two main characteristics of settler colonialism in this painting, land and people. Firstly, settler colonialism and land. Unlike traditional colonialism, which exploits resources and people, for settler colonies, which are places like America, Australia, New Zealand, land is obviously the key resource. Settler colonizers come to stay. So land and resources lie at the heart of American-Indian relations. The creation of the American nation demanded the dispossession of the indigenous populations, and it didn't take place nearly as pleasantly as this picture suggests. But it took place relentlessly. And here we have a map that shows how fast that dispossession, dispossession in that last half of the 19th century occurred. And we also have an advertisement. And you can see here Indian lands for sale. And you can see the different prices in 12 of the different states. So land is key for any settler colonial society. And displacement of the indigenous population is fundamental. So that little motif of the vanishing Indian is obviously something that's been created to support and back this agenda. This is a historian I have enormous respect for, unfortunately, has now died. This is the late Patrick Wolfe, an Australian historian, who has made very clear in his work on settler colonialism that it's a, a form of protracted invasion, and it's premised on displacing indigenous populations from the land in order to make way for the settlement of the colonizers. Obviously, he started thinking about Australia, which is where he's from, and then his work has been picked up and extended to other groups. And what he calls it, the replacement of all native peoples and societies, is governed by what he calls the ruling logic of elimination. And in America, just as in other settler colonial nations, this ruling logic of elimination meant that aggressive military campaigns were fought to subjugate indigenous people and dispossess them of their lands. And then these wars were followed by equally aggressive educational campaigns, which were organized to eliminate any surviving indigenous cultures. So the final war would be waged in the classroom against children. And this is the student body at the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, three years after it opened its doors and began to admit students from across the United States. It was the very first government boarding school, and in its 39-year history, it would recruit more than 10,000 students from almost every single reservation on America. It was a pride that they would actually bring, sort of like commodification, they would bring um, representatives of every single agency. So what we're looking at here are Kiowa and Cheyenne and Lakota and Navajo and Arapaho and Pueblo children, but they've all become Indians wearing Carlisle uniforms. And their different, very different histories and cultures have been visually obliterated. This is the Carlisle <coughs> campus. And you can see it was an old military barracks and it's still got the parade ground and that enclosed um, um, area where the students are playing, so to speak. So Carlisle's mission was deliberately to remove all native children that it could recruit from their home environments. And they were transported, and this is where the spread of the nation is important, because they were transported by train and brought to Carlisle, where the goal was to strip them of all aspects of their Indianness. It started with their clothing, but then it was their languages, their beliefs, and then finally it was meant to be their loyalties, because they would be taught English and Christianity and the gender roles, which you can see enacted here on the 
campus, they're separated out, and also the behaviours of white America in order to prepare them for citizenship. This is the man who founded the school, and that he was the first superintendent and ran it for its um, very early years. His name is Lieutenant, I'm going to say it in the American way, Richard Henry Pratt. And he proposed schooling rather than fighting to be the most effective solution to the nation's intractable Indian problem. Pratt had spent the first part of his career subjugating native nations out in the Southwest. He thought he understood Indians. And in fact, he did have a very good relationship with a lot of them, which enabled him to persuade them to send their children to his school. Without ever shedding his army uniform, he shifted from fighting them out in the West to schooling them in the East. And he argued, and this was very radical at the time because most people thought Indians were inferior, he argued that Indians had capacities equal to whites and once they'd been made to abandon their savage customs and be given very basic skills, they could compete in American scientists and they could be readily assimilated into the nation. In that way, native people would vanish and of course, native nations would cease to exist. So these are some pictures of the Carlisle student body. You can see the campus. And they were all taught to march, men, uh, girls and boys. And they were taught a trade alongside basic skills in reading, writing and arithmetic. The students were enrolled for about between three and five years. There were two ways of doing it, although many of them were re-enrolled. And some of them spent more than a decade at the school. And while they were there, they weren't allowed to go home because it was feared that if they did that the camp life would mean that they would, quote, return to the blanket. So instead, over the summer, the Carlisle students all went out into the local community, good toiling, farming, Quaker folk, where they would work on the farms or in the houses doing um, chores and learning by submersion to become Americans. And Pratt was convinced that this was the one, the, the one way that you could actually bring American Indians into the American nation. He completely disregarded the wishes or desires or cultural backgrounds of the native people, and he also disregarded the latent racism in American society, which meant an awful lot of um, Indian people who were educated could not find work, could not get jobs. His program, this program that he set up at Carlisle, was seen to work. The government loved it because it was solving a problem which they didn't quite know what to do about. And so... A whole system of Indian schools was set up across America. You can see this is Carlisle here. This is the first one. And the others are the, 25, the 24 that followed. Carlisle spawned these off-reservation military boarding schools. But they also built boarding schools on reservations so that children could be kept away from, quote, camp life. It was Carlisle's program was, became this, the template for this um, system of Indian schools. It was a model, not for just the United States, but it was also the model used in Canada. When it first opened, it was obviously an experiment. And as I'd said before, Pratt was seen to be quite ra radical because it was 1879 and in 1876, Custer's 7th Cavalry had been wiped out at the Battle of the Little Bighorn by the combined forces of the Lakota Sioux and the Cheyenne. And a lot of Americans doubted that savages could ever be educated and civilized, or indeed, if they should, if they should embrace them. So from day one, Pratt recruited the new medium of photography. He was very innovative in the way he used it. And he wanted to provide powerful visual evidence that this transformation could indeed be achieved. This is the first group of um, students that came in from Dakota Terry from Territory from Pine Ridge, and um, Rosebud agencies. They'd had to travel 1,500 miles by train and by um, boat, and they arrived at the station at midnight, and the people of Carlisle rushed out to see them because they wanted to see all these wild children. But the next morning, Pratt made sure that he had the local photographer, whose name was John Nicholas Choate, up on the campus with his camera and his mobile studio, which is what you needed with these great big glass plates that were used to make a series of photographs of these children while they were still dressed in their best regalia. The boys and the girls were taken separately. So I want to look a little bit closer at one of these pictures. The boys, obviously, there's more of them. And here we can see Pratt 
surveilling the, and, and this is the um, interpreter tacket, but I want to look a little bit closer at the, the one of the girls, because this is a very carefully constructed image. We can see they are ordered in a line and the white eye, or the, the sort of voyeuristic white eye, is being invited to gaze at this savagery and exoticism of their clothes. So we can see the striking designs of their blankets and the detail of some of the very beautiful elk tooth dresses that the girls are wearing, which would have only, an elk only has two of those teeth, so those are very expensive dresses. And all the jewellery and the adornment of their hair, etc. They're all up for our surveillance. But we can also see that the Carlisle mission has begun because they're being in, enclosed by this building with its portico, and they're also under this failing eye of Sarah Mather, who is a woman that went with Pratt to get, bring the women in, and he's not, he's actually half native, but he's dressed like a white man, so that they are enclosed and bookended very safely, and their savagery, if you like, is under con the control and discipline of the school already. So Choate began this idea of looking at creating before and after images, which Pratt encouraged. So this was the children when they first arrived, and then a few months later, when they had their school uniform, he took this group um, to show the progress in their civilization. And the exterior characteristics are presumed to be matched by their moral and intellectual changes. And Choate became the photographer for the Carlisle Indian School. He took lots of local people, and um, in, his, in his archive there's lots of um, different kinds of things, but he made his name taking photographs of Indians. So just about every Indian child that was brought to the school, there was this huge record, was photographed. So he took individual students in individual portraits, but he also took lots of groups. The arriving students were mostly taken on the bandstand. You can see this is the bandstand, which was in the middle of the school, in their regalia, outside, obviously, in the wild. And then once they had, their, well, had become more civilised, they were taken in their studio. And this is the, the, the family of Luther standing there, if you know his books. This is Luther here. Um, and his father. And all the different relations here. So... This became Choate's speciality, these before and after pairs that actually depict the vanishing Indian. Here we have a group of Navajo, again with Pratt surveilling them, 12 Navajo students newly arrived on the bandstand. And then we have the same group, only if you notice there are only 11 because in that six months one has already died, which was obviously a real problem for the Indian school. And this is, let me just hang on, let me just, this is Tom Torlino when he's in the group. And here he is here in the main group. But he was singled out because his pictures worked so well with what Church had to make this almost iconic image that became the piece that Pratt sent to everyone. He sent it to the president, he sent it to congressmen, he sent it to people who might um, make donations to the school. And we can see here the very striking changes that he's playing on. The change in the colour of his hair, obviously, the change in his um, clothing, and even the change in the look of, in his eye. It makes, this is one of the most dramatic transformations, and people love this, these, this duo. And together, all these pairs carry a very forthright message of a very seemingly and smooth transition from savagery to civilization, and therefore the very easy elimination of the Indian. Because when they're presented in these neat binary pairs, you can't see any, uh, there's no reference to the complex psychological and cultural processes that are being demanded. There's no process visible. It's all very neat and tidy. And as he got as he moved through his, the years, Choate made lots of different ones. It became a sort of formula. Here, here are, is a Lakota group, and here are some Pueblo children. And he used these as, uh, obviously he had to get the children when they first arrived in their regalia, but it became more and more difficult as they were coming in less with Indian clothing and more with white clothing. 
This was one that was particularly popular, and this is because it was Geronimo's children. These children were prisoners of war, and they had been captured. And you can see they've come in in a terrible-looking state because they've actually been on the run for a long time. But here they are, all spruced up, looking um, like civilised, possible apprentice Americans. He very, very quickly grasped that there was a hunger for pictures of Indians, just as Greg was talking about how everybody likes to dress up as an Indian, everybody loves an Indian. And that was true at this time, and he quickly developed a commercial list. So while he was taking pictures for the school to be kept in their records and as their archive, he was choosing the ones that he thought would be popular and putting them to a commercial list, which he sold in his studio downtown. And in the space of the first two years, he, got, he had more than 100 pictures that he was touting and selling to people, who then would slot them into little albums, those very nice plush albums, and collect them. And one of the things that he realized is that he could also get adult Indians, because the chiefs or the leaders would come to Washington to um, discuss or fight for their land rights, and on their way back, they would visit Carlisle to meet and visit their children. So here are some of the noted Indian chiefs that he took, and he put them all together on a card so you could buy them all at once. So this commodification has been described by one cultural historian as the photo conversion of Indians into property because it, commit, it permits white voyeurism and ownership of natives and the imaginary experience of controlling or owning Indians. It's only one more step to dressing up as an Indian. And the huge and enduring popularity of native people can in part be linked to an emotion that Renato Rosaldo has called imperialist nostalgia, which is this paradoxical phenomenon which is linked to mourning the thing that you've destroyed. And unsurprisingly, at the same time that the Carlisle photographs were circulating, Americans also begin to collect tobacco cards with Indian chiefs on them. They're same time as they're celebrating um, native cultures, apparently they're actually destroying the children's cultures in the school. So there's a kind of bizarre thing going on. So as we've seen, the, the Carlisle photographs, this is just a collection of them, there's hundreds of them, were very carefully choreographed. They constitute a colonial archive which was deliberately created and it was used by the school to sanction and advance the national geopolitical agenda. But what I want to suggest today is that some of these photos carry meanings and implications which are much more complex and multi-layered than was intended by their makers. And when viewed by the Carlisle students' descendants more than a century after they're taken, these photographs are susceptible to very different readings and very different uses, and they can be reclaimed and reframed and recoded. And they open up a possibility for reconnecting with ruptured pasts, with chapter in, which is very painful and lost in, in, for a lot of um, native tribes, and basically can become their own um, pictures again. So in the last part of this lecture, I want to talk about the whole, some, some acts of survivance. I want to give three very recent examples of ways in which descendant communities and individuals have reframed some of these Carlisle images, challenging and subverting the original purposes and renouncing what Gerald Visner, Anishinaabe from White Earth Reservation, what he has called survivance or acts of survivance or native acts of survivance, which renounce domination, they renounce tragedy, and they renounce victimry. And each one of these acts of survivance that I'm going to talk about necessitated a very active engagement with the Carlisle photo archives, as well as a really brave readiness to make the long journey to Carlisle and explore the archives and visit the surviving buildings and the cemetery of the school, obviously, which had a prime mission to extinguish their cultures. So I want to start with the work of the o Osage Nation Wajazi Cultural okay. Centre. Here we have Cynthia, uh, Cher uh, well, Cherokee, Chesawala is the director, and Cynthia Walter Gozad is the oral history person for that center. And they became concerned that much of the Osage knowledge, traditional knowledge, and a lot of the memories of the elders were going to be lost. So they set up this oral history project and went out and did a lot of interviews. 
And what Cherokee said is, she wrote to me and said, as we talked to our elders, the name of Carlisle kept coming up. And they heard details about the school's impact on the Osages who had been sent away to Carlisle. And they also detected this legacy of pain and loss and the fact that a lot of the elders refused to talk to them because the memories were too raw. So after their very extensive archival and oral research, they traveled from Pahaska, Oklahoma to Carlisle, Pennsylvania with a list of names of the Osages who had been at the Carlisle School and they went to the historical society there, and there they selected all the images of any Osage student or leader who had visited the school. And in total, they then took, collected a whole series of photographs about the activities of the school, so they had a context to present it in. And altogether, they ordered 210 photographs, which was the largest, largest order the, histor the historical society had ever received. They were a bit amazed. Um, and then they took them back to Pahaska, Oklahoma, to the Osage Reservation, to the Wajazi Cultural Center, where they created an exhibit. Now, Carlisle's mission had always been national, and so a lot of the presentation of the images and the stories are told from a national viewpoint. But here, at the Wajazi Cultural Center, they've ordered the photographs in, from an Osage perspective, and for the very first time, they're viewed by Osages in their own environment. So that the, the students, the very first, this first panel of the exhibition is the students and the leaders, not the activities. Carlisle's activities have been made to fall into second place. And here it is, ancestors. Here they can be seen as not Carlisle students representing civilization, but ancestors, who, and the names are recognized, and people are scrutinizing them for visual facial resemblances to their family and relations. And at the center, this is a center for all the cultural activities of the um, Osage, the photographs are a backdrop for lessons in Osage language, finger weaving, and obviously also dances as well. So I want to turn to my second example of cultural survivance and the vital weaving together of native community knowledge with these white created photographs that are held in the Carlisle archive. And this is a photograph of two Lipan Apache children who were brought to the Carlisle Indian School as prisoners of war in 1880. They had, before that, spent their days on the border with Mexico and, Tex uh, uh, Mexico and Texas where their people were fighting the US Army and losing their lands and losing their population. And they would withdraw into, Tex into Mexico. And then in 1877, while the warriors were away, the children's band was attacked by the 4th Cavalry and almost everyone was massacred. But these two children hid in the bushes and survived. And they were found by some soldiers afterwards and they were taken prisoner. But from that moment, they lost all contact with their family, their community, and their culture. So the massacre of women and children at the village was judged a huge success by the army. But for the Lipan Apache, it's remembered and known today as the Day of Screams. And after the attack, when the warriors came back, their leader, Ramon Castro, discovered that his two young children had been taken prisoner, and he never saw them again. But the Lipan Apache didn't forget these children. From that time down, for four generations, they passed this story in their oral history. And every year at their annual reunion, they would tell the story and mourn the children and hold a ceremony of remembrance for what they called, what, what they called the lost ones. So after their capture, what happened to the children? They lived for some years with a military family called Smith. And that's going to be an important name for this story. And they became known as Jack and Cassetta Smith. And when the Carlisle Indian School opened, the army insisted that they be taken from this family who had semi-adopted them, transported to Pennsylvania, and enrolled at Carlisle. Sadly, Jack only lived seven years, and he died, and he was buried in the Carlisle Cemetery. This is his grave here, although this is the reconstructed cemetery. And Cassetta remained classified as a prisoner of war for the rest of her life. She never went home. 
She remained on Carlisle's student roster for over 23 years, until shortly before her death at age 39. Most of those years she didn't spend in the Indian school. She spent out working for local families on what was called Carlisle's outing system to help them be embraced in the community. And this it was a repetitive, dreary life that she would return to the school and then get sent somewhere else until a very fateful placement with, a, with a, the Bishop family, where it seems she suffered some kind of exploitation or sexual ab abuse at the age of 36. It's very unclear in the record what's happened, but what is clear is that when she came back to school within a few months, it was noticed that she was definitely pregnant. So she was struck off the roster of the Carlisle Indian School, doesn't appear again in any of their records, and she gets sent to the Rosine home, which was a home for fallen women run by Quaker women in Philadelphia. And here her son was born. His, father, her, her, his, his father's uh, was unnamed but recorded as white. And Cassetta, organised by the Qu good Quaker women, it's one of the nice bits of the story, is allowed to keep her child and she finds a job in just a little town called Alaska, just north of Philadelphia where she works for three years. But then... At the age of 39, she dies of consumption. So the question then becomes what happens to little Richard, her son, who is by this time four. And the decision is made to send him back to where she came from, which was the Carlisle Indian School. And on his application form, his identity is confirmed as Indian. And ironically, on his student card, Richard is recorded as being a member of the Lipan Nation, although he grew up only with a very, very vague awareness of what his origins were, didn't have any clue who his people were, and he spent his whole life living in the Carlisle community and was known there as the Indian. And he even played Indian in 1963 for a Carlisle parade. So, like the stories of thousands of students who attended the Carlisle Indian School, Cassettes might only have been preserved by that photo we've got and the very brittle bureaucratic record which are on the student cards. But in 1991, a photograph arrived in the mail at the Historical Society in Carlisle, and it provided this vital component in the piecing together of her story. This photograph showed two Indian children, blank-faced, dressed in their Sunday best, and on the back was a handwritten dis message, uh, uh, description saying, Cassetta and Jack Smith, and then taken in Hayes City in February 1880. And it says, we get a school report and a letter from them every month, and they always address Molly, my wife, as dear mama. And this photograph had been sent by the grandchildren of the Smith family, who was hoping to find out more about these children who she knew had been part of her family. And the Indian biographer at the Carlisle in, at, um, Historical Society, I couldn't find any reference to any Indian child called Smith, but she instantly made the connection with the Lipan children, and because there were only two Lipan children at the school, and she slipped that photo into their file. And we can see that when placed alongside their Carlisle photo, these are definitely the same children. So when I began researching this story, the trail in Carlisle had gone dead, and I couldn't find Celeste Sorgio, who had sent the letter, but in Texas, the story was still very much alive. And on the internet, I found this little history of the Lipan Apache. And it was written by their general council chairman, Daniel Castro Romero, Jr. So I emailed the author, giving him details of the two children who'd been captured and taken to the Carlisle Indian School. And I asked him in this email if he knew anything about their band or anything about them. And I received this instant reply, which was a sort of mixture of delight and suspicion when he wrote, it's my understanding that the children were never to be seen or heard from. I'd be very interested in knowing the name and location of where they're buried so that I and our people can visit them to give them a lip and Apache blessing. Ramon Castro was my great, great, great uncle and it said the children taken were his children. Question, how did you find out about this? It's my understanding that only family members know about this story. So what Daniel Castro Romero had provided was evidence that 125 years after their capture, these Lipan children were still being remembered and celebrated and mourned by their own people. So I sent him copies of that, that, that the picture that I've shown you of the two children and also another picture of Cassetta, which was in the archive, and he wrote back. 
On the day I received the photographs, I was standing in line waiting to buy postage stamps when I opened your envelope. For a moment, I could see into my own daughter's eyes as my eyes watered at the picture of Cassetta. She looks exactly like my daughter. My ancestors must have been at a loss, not knowing where their daughter had gone, never to see her again. She will never again be forgotten as she has made the journey back home. I will come to Carlisle. And in May 2009, Daniel Castro Romero and two elders from the Lipan Apache tribe drove more than 1,500 miles from Tarn Carlisle to Texas. And they brought with them sage and corn and tobacco and soil from the lands where the Lipan Apache lived and also water from their river for the sacred spirit-releasing ceremonies. And before conducting the ceremonies for Cassetta and Jack and for Cassetta's son Richard, Romero spoke about the pain and destruction this loss had inflicted on his people for generations. He explained that all Lipan elders firmly believed that the Lipan Apache could never prosper and survive until the lost ones were found, so that their spirits could be blessed by a traditional ceremony and they could return home. So its archival research and photographs, when linked to the Lipan oral history, together supplied this vital evidence enabling the severed hearts of these children's two lives to be reconnected so they could be reclaimed by their people in this act of cultural survivance. This is a very sad, but it's a very heartening story in a deeply disheartening history. And now many more like this may, may be able to be assembled, linking the Carlisle archival record with memories and stories held in native communities. This is now possible because since last year, the Carlisle student records have been made available on the internet. This is, looks very boring because it's a picture of a um, repository, but through that you can reach all the student files and pictures and publications. The Carlisle Indian School Digital Resource Center, of which I'm very proud to be a partner, secured a very large Andrew Mellon digitization grant. So now all the student files that are housed in the National Archive, to which most people living out in the West can't get access. Now they've been scanned and they're all available online. So I want to end my presentation by showing how these Carlisle archives are being used now back in native communities by native teachers and tell you about two very personal acts of survivance which were performed by two of these native teachers this summer. In the summer, just gone, July, a group of teachers were awarded scholarships. It was a scholarship money that we applied for it was federal money, so it was Trump's money, paying for these native people to come to Carlisle, <laughs> which was, uh, felt rather good. So a group of, it was supposed to be a group of a dozen, but my colleague did wonderful accounting, and we brought 19 teachers to Carlisle to study the archive, get to know how to use the online resources, and draw up a lesson plan while they were there, which they would show to each other, so to show integrating these sources into their teaching. For many of these um, teachers, coming to Carlisle was actually very courageous and slightly traumatic, especially when we made a site visit up to the school and um, to the cemetery in particular. This is a picture of the cemetery that I took at that time. So, and then I'm just going to, this is the, that was visiting the cemetery, and here we are in the, on, in the middle of the, Carlisle campus on the bandstand. It's still, it's a replacement, but it still stands right in the middle of the bandstand. And I just want to introduce two of the students here. The first is Michael, and the other is Joni. So this is Michael, and this is how he told me he wanted me to introduce him. My name is Michael R. Begay. I am of the Salt Clan, born for the edge of the Water Clan. My maternal grandfather is of the Towering House clan, and my paternal grandfather is of the Black Sheep clan. This is how I introduce myself to see if we are related. I am Danae, the Navajo, meaning the people. Michael is a teacher at the Santa Fe Indian School, and this school was founded in 1890. It's one of those ones on that map that was spawned by Carlisle, one of those 25 off resident preservation boarding schools. But since 2001, it has been run by New Mexico's Pueblos, and its goals are now in direct opposition to those laid down at Carlisle. 
The ideal graduate will understand the issues facing tribes in the Southwest and would be committed to maintaining Native American cultural <coughs> values. So you couldn't get much further from Carlisle than that. And in his lesson plan, Michael decided to, to organise his um, project around then and now. And he uses contrasting photographs. One of the Carlisle, a group of Carlisle women who are returning home in this respectable clothing with their wonderful hats. Um, and then the one of the Santa Fe graduating class where they look totally different. And it's a theme that was picked up in her commencement address by Michelle Obama, who you can see just there, when she, when she said, the, when she, in her speech, she said, the traditions that this school was designed to destroy are now expressed in every square foot of this place. Look at you now. And of course, you know, they absolutely loved having her. And Michael, his personal act of survivance, when visiting the grounds of the Indian school, he wore a T-shirt which very ironically displayed a phrase from one of the United States' most venerated founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, where the only mention of Indians is as merciless Indian savages. Now, the strategy used by Joni was very different. This is Joni Romero. She's from Cochiti Pueblo, and she, is, she works at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Before Joni travelled to Carlisle, she was very nervous, and because many of the because of all the forbidding associations, and she wanted to be ready emotionally and spiritually. So she went to a spiritual leader to seek guidance on how to prepare herself for the many things that she was going to experience. Now Joni focused her lesson plan on issues of transgenerational trauma, the ways in which trauma experienced by one generation get passed down to the offspring and can be experienced by subsequent generations. She was very moved by attending the Institute, and she wrote in her feedback that it had changed her life. She said she'd become much more aware of all the historic roots of the challenges of the native community where she lives. So pre to prepare for the group visit to the barracks, which she considered a spiritual journey, Joni dressed in her skirt and her Pueblo moccasins, and the moccasins were a sign of respect for the dead children. And she went and stood on the bandstand, which is where all the, as a sort of iconic gesture to all the children that had stood there, to be made the subject of the camera's eye and be used as propaganda for the Indian school. And she faced down, this is Pratt's old residence, she faced down with her own glare and the camera's glare, the residence of the man who had set up the Indian school. So this was a very formative moment for her. And she then took this picture and used it on her new business card. So here she has, and she's incorporated her defiance to Carlisle and its mission into her own personal identity. It's a little card this size, but I've blown it up here. So. Joni has basically taken back the, the power, which is what she um, was seeking to do. So I, I want to end, not with Joni, I'm just going to end, well, I am going to end the slideshow with Joni, but I want to end, give the final word of this presentation to Greg Deal, who we began with. He's our um, Indian in the headdress at the very beginning, and a little clip from his film, which he called The Last American... Indian on Earth. There is power in knowing our history, good, bad, or indifferent. We are empowered by it. We are propelled by it. And everything we do now isn't for us, but for our children and our children's children. We are rising up and creating change in our communities and throughout the land that we call North America. We recognize that this is Indian land that we are a covenanted people in the space that the Creator has given us, that we are stewards over this land, and we will continue to grow and rise and empower ourselves through knowledge of history and of self, overcoming ethnic genocide. We know where we came from. We know how we got here. The policies that have been put in place throughout American history have been policies of elimination. Simply knowing that means knowing that our very existence is a protest and we will protest 
for as long as we carry breath. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was very moving um, uh, and very poignant and inspiring, so thank you. My name's Sarah Barrow. I'm the Pro Vice-Chancellor for Arts and Humanities here at UEA. Um, it gives me great pleasure to say a few words of thanks to Jacqueline, a vote of thanks, to invite a few questions, um, which we can continue over a drink afterwards. Um, thank you all for being here, of course. Um, these words have been sent to me by uh, Jacqueline's um, colleague, Malcolm McLaughlin, uh, head of the School of Art, uh, Media and American Studies, uh, within which Jacqueline has worked for some time in its previous formations, on behalf of all her colleagues. So uh, I just want to credit all of those. Um, Jacqueline has been the champion of Native American Studies at UEA, first in the Old English and American Studies sector, and then in the School of American Studies after 2004, and then AMA. Her presence has ensured that the discipline of American Studies at UEA developed with a pronounced interest in Native American history and culture, and on the back of that, an engagement with matters of racial justice and human rights. Her work in this respect anticipated and has met the growing concern we see among the current generation of students for learning about the legacies of oppression and about America's history of conquest and dispossession, as we saw just there. Jacqueline's teaching is a distinctive and compelling mix of a political and ethical engagement with questions of human rights, the historian's craft of archival, archival research and interdisciplinary approaches to American culture and particularly visual culture, as we saw this evening. It's won her rightful recognition for her teaching, the admiration of her students, a good number of whom have over the years taken her classes through undergraduate and postgraduate study before undertaking research under her supervision. It may well be that some of you are here this evening. That generosity of spirit is one that so many colleagues have also experienced. Um, and I myself, just over the previous weeks, have been lucky enough to uh, have a few very kind words from Jacqueline as well, which are always much appreciated. Jacqueline is known as someone to whom one can turn to for advice, knowing that she'll listen without judgment. She's been particularly keen to, to support new recruits, new to the profession, offering advice and the benefit of her experience. She's known as someone who's been especially supportive of women in the academy, having herself been a champion of gender equality at UEA from the days when, when men were perhaps overwhelmingly in the majority. So thank you, Malcolm, for those words. Thank you, Jacqueline, for this evening. Um, another round of applause for Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, it's not obligatory, but if anybody has a question they'd like to pose or a comment they'd like to make um, to Jacqueline at the stage, we have time for a couple of questions. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, did Richard have any children himself? No. So Richard had a very interesting life. He was adopted by a white family and he inherited a very substantial property. And he married an older woman later in life. He sort of recreated that white family when his original white family died, but no, unfortunately, he didn't. <laughs> I, I wondered that too, and I did research it. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. I would from the Adelaide and the Santa Fe School. Are there many other schools like that now throughout the USA, encouraging much more interest mm -hmm. in Yes, I mean, there are, there are a lot... Santa Fe is unusual because it's obviously it's a descendant of the other kind of Indian school, but there are a few like that. There's uh, Riverside in California. So I think there are four Bureau of Indian Affairs, ex Indian Affairs schools that were born through Carlisle, but there are an awful lot of smaller um, projects. You know, the old Albuquerque Indian School um, in um, Albuquerque is now run independently and with a similar outlook. The problem, of course, is always funding. So it's, it's whether they, where they're going to be funded from. Yeah. Showing a photograph of um, the women in their hats. Where yeah. were they going? They were going home. They went home. The, the whole idea that they would be assimilated didn't actually work. So they very few um, <coughs> merged into the white community. They're, they're, they're harder to track, of course. But they went home, and they all would arrive home looking like that on the reservation. So you can imagine there was a... <laughs> A terrific <laughs> conflict of cultures for them and for their families. And they didn't, you know, they, so they, they lived in a sort of twilight zone, but, and they had to make some Were kind of decision. 
Well, it was quite difficult for them and their families, and different people negotiated it in different ways. A lot of them were employed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to work at the agency, because they obviously had reading and writing school. But it was a, it was a painful situation. Um, you know, I don't think um, that negotiating back was easy for, for any of them. And in fact, there was one Mr. Carlisle student who, who went back and actually shot someone, uh, shot an army officer, in order to claim his Indianness back. So, you know, some, that was a drastic solution, but I, I think a very, very uncomfortable and obviously very difficult um, cultural issue. Yeah, two questions down here. What happened to the Carlisle schools? What happened to the Carlisle Indian school? The Carlisle, this, well, the, a lot of those other ones slowly got converted, in, you know, or were, were folded. And some of them, as I say, have now become like the Santa Fe Indian School, and others, other, others of them were closed down. I mean, the Santa Fe, the original, perhaps I should tell you this, the original Santa Fe Indian School, the original buildings, you saw those buildings, they were not like those army um, ones. When the Pueblo Committee took it over, they bulldozed the whole lot. It's a different solution to what some other people, to just, because there were so many people in the community had such painful memories. The Carlisle Indian School, once they realised how expensive it was to ship all these children and they were educating them on reservations and it, they didn't think it was going to work, it became a medical school. And right now, it's the US Army War College. So this is the only oh. Indian cemetery on an active Army War College. But actually, it had some advantages because just this summer, because it's under the Army, the first group of Indian Northern Arapaho repatriated there some children from the cemetery because they had to follow the army rules about a relative taking back. So actually it had a, an advantage, mm. but yes, yeah, pretty spooky, for, especially when you go there. Final question. Oh. In the beginning there was, I think, a map, four maps of different... Time periods. Time periods. They showed the land being shrunk down. Yes, the first one, which had the most Indians living there, it seemed to be empty on the east of the United States, of America. Well, it's full of white people. <laughs> so, that's so, so this was, if you like, the progression of all that. The black was Indian lands, and as the white progresses, that's where white people are spreading. Okay, but before that, it was Indian as well. It was black before. The whole thing was native, and then, the, then those original 13 colonies got built. And they lived alongside native people for a long while. But the, 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 what spelt doom for the native people was American independence. Because previously, the English didn't want wars being precipitated because they had to go and fight them, pay for all that. But once the Americans had declared their, their independence and they had a free nation, you know, they were ready to fight Indians. So that it was at the creation of the United States spelt doom for all the indigenous people, literally. Well, that's, I, that's part of this project, because it's bringing together, you know, I've got the archive, and I've looked at the archive, and I know what happens in Carlisle, but out on the reservations in the, and in the communities are the memories and the stories, and all the people with the photographs to bring it all together. So we've got an interactive capacity on this site, which is about to go live, where people can put photographs up there, so you can actually keep, keep creating the whole archive and it will come, the story will then become complete. But tracing, the, I mean, tracking all, I mean, there are 10,000 Carlisle students tracking all of them. You have these kind of, it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle with only five pieces, you know. It's, so that's why when I found, was tracking the... But that's going to be part of this process. That's, yeah, because now it requires the native people to become engaged and bring their side of the story. Because this is pretty brittle archival and it's all through the, the official voice of wanting to Americanize Indian. And of course, because they recruited people from every single reservation, every single reservation has a connection to Carlisle and people that are descended from it. So it's, if you like, a huge national project, which, uh, yeah, it's just great. <laughs>
Okay, thank you so much, Jacqueline. It was wonderful. Um, we are going to be able to uh, experience some of the next project of Jacqueline's here in, uh, in UEA at Norwich through the Sainsbury Centre, where there are going to be artists in residence, community choirs, native choirs. It's going to be fantastic. So thank you very much again, and uh, we invite you now to take a drink. Thank you. Thank you.